Her talk is going to be using fictional techniques to shape nonfiction. And she is an acclaimed nonfiction book author and her focus is women and social history. Beacon Press uh, will be putting out, has put out her latest book, Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin and the other women behind the founding father, Ben Franklin. And that came out in February. Nancy directs the Cape Cod Writers Center and has written for the New York Times and multiple national magazines. So let me start her slides and I give you Nancy Rubin Stewart. Hello, nice to meet you all. It's my, my delight to be here. I'm excited about it. Um, and you have really quite an incredible Writers Center. Um, makes me wanna take some of your courses. Um, before we begin, I just want to say th these are slides that have to do with the book, and they will tell the story. But before we do that, um, because um, I'm going to be talking about uh, using fictional techniques, and indeed I am using fictional techniques in this book, and it's been commented upon by some reviewers already. The book, by the way, was delayed because of shipping issues. It came out a week ago, so... But it's, it's widely available. Um, so, um, I, 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 you know, when I wrote the book, I didn't, because I do write that way, but I didn't think about the fictional techniques I use. But having, having considered it now, I'm looking back at the book and I, I've sort of, um, I think I've uh, narrowed them down to five, five techniques that I think um, probably speak to this book. And uh, I have uh, given to um, Joe and Brenda, uh, I guess in the office, your, all your other people, um, a Word document where I've taken excerpts from parts of this book that will illustrate uh, some of the things I've tried to do. But basically, um, I'll just list the things that I've tried to do in the book. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the characters and some of the events in the book. Um, and, and how this all worked. So the first thing I think that's real important, uh, whether you're writing, certainly you know this for fiction, but you may not know completely and understand it for nonfiction, because those of us who've been journalists a long time, as I was, you know, we were trained to really keep our writing just to the facts, ma'am, nothing personal, um, keep it neutral, you know, both, both sides of the, of the story uh, and accuracy, and that's it. And that still applies um, in, uh, it applies in fiction, but it especially applies in, non, in nonfiction. But it's important to, to think about vivid description. In, and you know, new journalism ever since the, seven, the, uh, the 1960s has changed that. And even today, when you look at the New York Times now, and it's changed so much since I used to write for them, uh, so many, even, even hot news stories have the beginnings and openings that are filled with vivid description. So that's something that, you know, is very important in writing nonfiction now. It's, it's something we want. We want to be drawn in. We want to see the scene in our head. We don't just want the facts, um, uh, what, whatever they are, whether they're in aviation or protozoa. <laughs> we want, and some of you have alluded to it in the earlier meeting, that you've made this come to life, um, you know, which is, which is a wonderful. But that's, that's something that, that you have to keep doing throughout the book. Otherwise, um, I think today's writers, readers in particular, um, since they do so much reading on screen, that's factual. I think when they sit down with a nonfiction book, they, they do also wanna be entertained and not just informed. So description has taken on a new uh, importance. I also use a technique sometimes uh, although not, not, you have to use it rather carefully. It's more like seasoning, um, which is to foreshorten um, or to give a tease, but not too much. But, uh, and, you know, gifted fiction writers do this very well. Um, but it's important to do just enough of it um, to let your reader know without hitting them over the head with it or giving away too much that something, you know, this is only the beginning, there's, there's much more, this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. Again, fiction writers can do this 
you know, with a lot more license than we can as nonfiction, but it's important to do those teases. And uh, in that paper that I've given, and I guess um, Joe or Brenda, I guess you'll be able to give it to people that I've sent. It won't be part of this slideshow um, that you'll see just at least one example of that. Um, another one is what I call creative description based upon research. Yes, it's research. Yes, it's description, but it's what is around the subject. For instance, um, when I'll be talking a little bit later about uh, Deborah, uh, Ben Franklin's wife, uh, about what she had to do as a colonial wife um, to take care of a child in, in colonial America. So that requires a lot of other kinds of research um, that one has to do a lot of reading, a lot of digging to find out what that scene could really meant in, in real terms and, and to make it vivid. Um, and that's, that's important too. Um, it's hard to keep that going in nonfiction when you've got the engine of getting your, your, your story and your facts out, but important to, to do that and to keep doing it here and there so that your reader will feel that they are seeing it, they're living it, they're, they're part of that story. Um, the, also, of course, we can't use dialogue uh, the way we can, you certainly can in fiction, which is great fun, <clears throat> but you can use quotations, whether they're from letters or diaries, uh, court records, uh, whatever. And of course, <laughs> this particular book is obviously about colonial America. So, of course, I'm depending on letters and some newspapers, but wherever you can use that, again, it brings to mind, it, it, you get the, uh, the, uh, the character's voice, it makes them very real. So that's one thing to keep, keep doing whatever you're doing in nonfiction today. And, you know, um, I think we did that before in nonfiction years ago, but not the way that we have to do it today. As I say, I think the expectations for readers today are very different, that when they sit down with a book, a nonfiction book, they want to be entertained. Uh, and finally, something you all know, um, certainly fiction writers, it's kind of a, it's the Bible, which is um, the narrative, attention to the narrative arc, um, the rising action, the climax, sometimes there are a couple of climaxes, but anyway, um, and then finally the falling action. And when you're telling a story um, in nonfiction, it's not quite, it's not quite as plastic um, or predictable. Um, in fiction, you can do whatever you want. You can, you can add something in, you can murder somebody, you can make an explosion, you can do whatever you need to do. But alas, in writing nonfiction, we just don't have that luxury. You have to go by the facts and you have to, you have to knit a whole piece, an organic piece um, that will be a story. And it, that's not always easy to do. So in the paper that I have alluded to here several times, you will see that I've, um, I've actually taken a little bit from one beginning of the books, uh, one thing in the middle of the book that I would say was sort of one of the cl a climax and finally the, the falling at the very end of the book of falling action. Um, so um, that's all I'm gonna say about it right now. And um, you'll see that only loosely as I go through these slides, but afterwards I'm happy to talk to you about it if you have questions. And most of all, um, yeah, I hope that you, um, that you uh, see those papers and, and then, yeah, sure, I hope you buy the book too, <laughs> or at least tell other people about it. Um, so thank you for your patience. And I guess we'll go on with the slides. The book, of course, um, began for me with a question, which is what was, I did not understand uh, Deborah. Um, did not understand, uh, there have been a lot of bad things written about her. Um, traditional histories have marginalized her or they've um, degraded her into a stupid, shrew, dumpy woman. And yet there was this affectionate marriage that, that seemed to last, by the way, 43 years, but there were two times, two years, one was a 15 year period, another was, was, a, was a 10 year period where they lived apart. And it was like, well, why did they live apart? So that's one of the short, short reason why I wrote this, researched and wrote this book. I will go to the next slide, please. You all know Benjamin Franklin. There've been 101,000 books written on Benjamin Franklin. I'm not exaggerating. World Cat, Catalog, World Cat Library said 101,000 books. I mean, I'm not surprised. 
So we all know him, we learned about him in school, we have a certain image of him, and we know about his lightning and electricity, and we know about signing the independence, and, and I'm sure we know that he also uh, obtained funding uh, and from the French uh, to help with the uh, American Revolution. Next slide, please. And probably you've heard about the Poor Riches Almanac. You may have read some of those really sort of wry and often funny quotes and bits of wisdom and, and cautionary tales and proverbs that are, you know, that we, there are, to us they're not, at this point, they're almost cliches, but some of them, if you read through, and there are, oh, there are, uh, I think, uh, 23 years of, of almanacs. <laughs> they're really quite amusing. Uh, but again, they contribute to this image of Ben as the ultimate rationalist, the man who puts logic over reason, uh, logic over passion, reason over emotion, and is this wise person. Uh, and the almanacs certainly, you know, they certainly point to this kind of a cautionary approach to life, a discretion above everything. And the next slide, please. And of course, we know Ben is the master of thrift. Uh, and, you know, not only a famous publisher, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, he was a, really a media, media mogul for his day. He owned, um, besides the Pennsylvania Gazette, which he started, he, his hands were into everything. And he eventually owned paper mills in other, in other uh, colonies. Uh, he had several Gazette imitators in other states that were his. And people, people he, was, he was famous for this. So this is the Ben we know. Next slide, please. Uh, ben loved women, uh, but he, and he, he found his attraction to them as dangerous as electricity itself. Um, and, but yet he's, he's, he's as I say, an attraction. The charge was, was a bit of a thrill. Even as a, a youngster, as a apprentice apprentice, he wrote in a woman's voice, pretending to be a widow who was making fun of Boston's Puritans, Cotton Mather and that whole scene. And he became known, he, he anonymously wrote in his, he was apprentice apprentice to his brother. He anonymously wrote and had published because they were so good. These, there's 13 or so sort of um, quite, um, quite fascinating, especially since he was only 16 or 17. Uh, sort of takes on uh, Boston, colonial Boston and its hypocrisies. And one of them, he admires the prostitutes. And he says they were so important for the economy and so important for the shoe, shoe uh, makers business. And they're really quite wry, but you know, that's just an early example of where he was at with women. Next, please. Uh, he did fly, flee finally from his brothers, found the apprenticeship cruel and he fled to Pennsylvania. And uh, there he worked for a printer and then eventually he came to room. Well, even before that, when he fled, he, um, he was a runaway and he arrived two weeks later, dirty and unkempt and starving. And he, he walked by uh, Market Street near Deborah Reed's house. Her father was John the Carpenter. And he was, he walked by and he was holding two huge rolls under one arm and he was ravenously devouring another one. And her first reaction was, was to laugh. And as he later writes in his biography, his autobiography, he said he made a ridiculous, um, a ridiculous awkward appearance. But a few months later, when he did have his job with the printer and his trunk of clothes had come and he came back to John Reed's house and asked to rent a room. And Deborah was amazed, and <laughs> that was it. It was like this: this man was was good looking, well groomed, well spoken, well dressed, and she was impressed. And eventually, he he uh, courted her, as he wrote in his autobiography. Now, Deborah uh, was uh, already, we believe, uh, working with her mother. Her mother had a, a thriving ointment and salve business, and Deborah must have learned her bookkeeping skills. Uh, and her financial skills from her mother, because uh, what well, you'll see what happens. But anyway, uh, so Ben and uh, and Ben was attracted to her, and they became engaged. The only thing is, he was going to go to England. Uh, the governor of uh, the, the colony of Pennsylvania was sending him there to buy printing equipment to set up his own shop. Well, the governor wasn't quite honest about that. But anyway, uh, in the just before he left, Deborah's father died. Um, and Mrs. Frank, Mrs. Reed said to the couple, look, you can't get married. 
first of all, Ben's going to England. And secondly, you're too young. You'll just have to wait till he comes back and he's settled. And Deborah was distraught. But off Ben went promising to write, and he didn't. Uh, he was enjoying London in various ways, uh, including probably, we don't know exactly when, because he had a way, he had a habit of sort of glossing over, at least in his autobiography, many of the, well, important emotional moments in his life. So we do know that he began to, as he put it, remarkable too for an 18th century memoir, that he began to associate with low women uh, at a great expense and, and in some danger to his health. Anyway, he wrote to Deborah, he said, I don't know whether I'm coming back and I'm not sure, I don't know when and I'm not sure I will. And that was, that set off an enormous uh, concern for Deborah and her, her mother. And eventually Deborah did allow somebody else to, to um, court her and she did marry uh, this person. He was English, um, but he'd come to America it, and he was a potter. But, and of course, Deborah had a dowry, which of course he got. And then within maybe two months, Deborah discovered that he had been married, he was married, and he had a child that were in England. That was it for her. She, she ended the marriage and she refused to have anything to do with him. Meanwhile, he had her dowry and he was, a, he was in debt. He, he ended up squandering it. And eventually we hear that he fled to the Barbados. We don't know um, what happened to him, but that left Deborah in a very strange position. Uh, by the age of 19 or so, she was neither single nor married. She couldn't get a divorce. They didn't know where her husband was. They didn't know he was dead or alive. He had all these debts. Uh, she became sort of an untouchable in terms of other suitors. So somebody was, was spirited and and uh, sociable and laughter and, and feisty, now was quite depressed. Ben came back, uh, saw her, uh, paid his respects, uh, socialized or at least gave advice to Mrs. Frank and Mrs. Reed uh, about her business and so on, started his own uh, printing company uh, with somebody else, then eventually himself, and courted other women. And the father said, no way, because he was, they didn't believe printers made much money. So around uh, in the summer of uh, 1730, he came to Mrs. Reed and he, he explained how guilty he felt and how it was his fault that Deborah had married this, this ne'er-do-well. And now she was in a terrible situation. And he, he proposed to Deborah. And as he put it in his autobiography, I took her to wife on September 1st, 1730. In other words, a common law marriage. Now, Deborah proved a fabulous wife. She immediately took over his little stationery shop near his print shop, turned it into a general store, added many things. Um, of course, she knew everyone in Philadelphia and, 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 uh, and you know, became quite successful with it. She also helped him in his print shop and, he, and being having already good bookkeeping skills, um, she helped Ben with them a great, great deal. And they did very well. Uh, at least they were doing well uh, But uh, at the beginning. But if we go on to the next slide, just for a moment, we're going to go back. Suddenly, Ben arrived home just six months after they were married. And he arrived home with a, a child. And that child was his illegitimate son. Now, she was horrified. Uh, she's not even quite 20. And she's to take care of somebody else's child. Who, where was the mother? We don't know. We don't know to this day. Theories, many theories. The historians always have many theories. Well, uh, probably it wasn't a prostitute because he claimed the paternity for that child. Um, so it probably, at least one of the historians thinks it might have been somebody who was a woman of, of a higher rank that uh, he was uh, dallying with whose husband was away. In any case, and next slide, please, this child will eventually grow up to become William Franklin, the governor, the loyalist governor uh, of, 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 of uh, New Jersey. Can we go back two slides now, just for one moment, please? Thank you. So um, Deborah did bring, did raise him, not, not happily, uh, the, and the, the relationship was never happy, um, but she did. And she soon became pregnant uh, with her own child, Frankie, but frankly, and I won't go into the story now uh, in the interest of time, but Frankie, uh, within a few years, despite Ben's 
warnings to people about getting inoculated from smallpox, uh, he could not inoculate that child because he, the, the little boy had dysentery. So Frankie died and they were heartbroken. Um, but anyway, the, the, Deborah worked very hard by Ben's side and he rose not only as a printer uh, and a publisher and he published books now as well as his newspaper, Pennsylvania Gazette and all. Uh, and he was civic minded, civil minded. He wanted to do things for the good of Pennsylvania. He wanted to make Philadelphia the leading city, the most advanced city in America. And he worked hard at it. He started things like the lending library. He started the Junto, uh, which eventually um, and becomes part of what would become uh, an intellectual organization known as the American Philosophical Society. He started a university. Well, it was called an academy. It is now the University of Pennsylvania. He um, thought there should be a fire department because of the fires. He thought the street should be paved and he worked hard on these. He had the position as a, as a clerk of the assembly, he soon became uh, uh, elected to the assembly. And by then he was the postmaster of, of Pennsylvania. Enormous um, value to that. He learned a great deal uh, from newspapers coming in from all over. He was the first one to get all of that. And he learned a great deal that other learned people around America, he began to, in colonial America, he began to, to uh, communicate with and people from overseas. Of course, he already had some friends in England. Uh, so by the 40s, the 1740s, he was a wealthy man. Uh, and, and Deborah, and he does give her credit, he said it was, he was fortunate because in Deborah, he had a frugal wife uh, who, who um, was very good at managing affairs and thereby proved a fortune to, to him. So we know Deborah, despite the views of her, uh, that she was stupid, that she was no near, near his intellectual quality. Yes, she was not, no, no intellectual. And she wasn't as well read, obviously. Um, but she was a, 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 a talented woman in her own way and uh, a, a terrific wife. Um, she not only brought up his illegitimate child, uh, eventually had another child, a daughter named Sally, uh, but she entertained his family. Uh, sometimes they stayed for weeks on end. She nursed uh, or ill neighbors uh, continually. Um, she, um, she managed many of his affairs to the point where he actually, when he went on trips, who did he appoint to be power of attorney? That's how much he trusted her, Deborah. So, you know, the American Philosophical Society has some ledgers from early the Franklins. There are many, many notations from her. So clearly she was, as Ben said, and Ben never gave praise lightly, that uh, she was very important, uh, really a financial manager uh, of sorts. Um, however, her spelling, if you can go further in the slides now, go, please go three slides, I think it is, to the next one, yes. Her spelling was atrocious. Women who were middle class were taught to read, write, and maybe some computing, but not to spell. So this is what traditional historians saw um, that looks just awful and hard to read. And she looks, it looks, it looks ignorant. But if you read it carefully, and here I've just given two examples where she's astute with her money. One of them is I begin to keep an account of expenses. And another one, she said she inquired about Thomas Miller's houses and Amos Strudel bought them at one third more than they're worth. Indeed, I wouldn't have given half that he did for them. Um, so, you know, already, and she did later buy and sell property and a lot of other things. Um, so she's, she's been pretty much maligned uh, historically uh, until very recently and until feminist scholarship is beginning to understand and, and plummet um, what is beneath what, what looks like, um, yes, a woman who is really not very capable. Um, ben is appointed by the assembly um, to be the postmaster, actually not by the assembly, by the crown, to be the postmaster general of all the colonies. And he does this, he changes things greatly in the very, very primitive postal delivery system. Uh, what he does, uh, just a few quick facts on that, he creates a dead letter office. He en engages express riders to get that mail moving quickly. Um, and uh, he does overnight delivery and a lot of other things. Uh, he makes the payment system, which was extremely awkward, uh, streamlines it, and many, many other things, but what he, uh, he was um, quite remarkable. Of course, he was fascinated by electricity, and once he 
retired around the time, by the way, his daughter Sally was born, 1743, he starts experimenting with electricity. And of course, we know that by 1750, he's internationally known for what he did uh, in, in determining that uh, electricity was, a, was really a force of nature and negative positive charges created artificially as well as what was going on with lightning and of course his invention of the lightning rod. Um, but in his capacity as postmaster, um, he, uh, he actually rides, uh, does tours of the colonies. And one of the places uh, that he goes is Boston. And, you know, we have all these stories about Ben being this, these silly stories about him being this super lecherous human being uh, and that he, uh, you know, had many illegitimate children and all these ridiculous myths. And in my research, uh, you know, I don't see a lot of evidence. I do see a lot of uh, attention to women and he's the first to admit it in his letters and his autobiography. But, uh, you know, the, the ridiculous claims that have been made about him are not true. Uh, however, uh, while he is at that dangerous age of 48, he's on a tour in Boston and he meets a young woman uh, who is 23, who he and she become fascinated with each other. And what, what happens, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, what happens is they have a, they, they have a, a, a great, infatuation. And um, he accompanies her because she's from Block Island. He accompanies her from Boston to Rhode Island, spends time with her in uh, two, two or three days and then another week. Um, and we don't know where they stayed overnight. Uh, for a while, there was another woman with them, but she left. But what we do have are their letters and not all of them, because they admit that they were destroying, especially, especially Katie, who he calls her Katie, especially Katie, destroys many of them because she feels they're too passionate and embarrassing. Apparently, apparently, uh, Ben wanted to, quote, teach Katie multiplication, uh, and Katie refused. So this is just one letter that he, he writes to her. He promised to send me kisses in the wind. Your favors come with the snowy fleeces, which are as pure as your virgin innocence, white as your lovely bosom, and as cold. Um, so he's he's upset that she she won't she won't uh, she won't grant him intimacy. I'm using this quote and just in reference to what we're talking about with fiction and nonfiction. I don't have dialogue. I do have wonderful quotations um, from letters. So that relationship eventually evolves because he cannot consummate it and he has to return to Philadelphia. Although he does that sort of regretfully. Uh, and it evolves into one in which he's avuncular and he's soon giving her advice about other suitors and they remain friends and correspond throughout their lives. Next slide, please. He is sent uh, in 1757 by the assembly to England uh, to collect, uh, well, to, to, try to, to try to convince the Pens who own the Royal Charter to Pennsylvania uh, to pay their taxes to help defend the frontier. Uh, because from the French and Indian War and before that, there's uh, a great deal of hostility and invasions and destruction. And at one point, even uh, the, uh, there's invasions from angry settlers who were displaced by the French and Indian War, uh, who actually come to Germantown in Philadelphia. So he is sent to straighten this out by the assembly and he expects Deborah to go with him and Deborah refuses. Why? Well, we don't know. Of course, the historians, as usual, have their theories, um, perhaps because she came over as a very young child in a perilous tra transatlantic journey in 1711, when she was five or six, and remembers the horrors of that. Those voyages were like that, if you've read any of the accounts, um, or because she was quite settled in Philadelphia. She was had a certain stature there now, even though she was middle class, she knew everybody. She'd worked in the post office. She'd run her store. Uh, she knew many people. She uh, socialized and was highly respected uh, with some of the elite leaders. Uh, and maybe she felt that um, it, she didn't want to go, especially since Ben was only supposed to be gone six months. In any case, she didn't go. And Ben went himself. 
And while he was there, he stayed in a townhouse on Craven Street. It's in central London. I've been by it myself. Uh, it's now a museum. Uh, at the time that I was there, the museum wasn't open. Um, and he lodged with a woman, a middle-class uh, widow named Margaret Stevenson. Margaret Stevenson was about his age. She had a daughter um, who lived elsewhere, who was uh, by then in her, I'd say 20, 19 or 20 years of age, who lived with an aunt, uh, an elderly aunt who needed care. And Margaret rented rooms to travelers. So Ben had rented rooms for her. And it seems as though, uh, and they, by the way, Ben's journey lasted five years. It seems as though their relationship was a lot more than just landlady. She, he became ill, given the coal burned, cold, cold and dust in the air and the fog in London at that time. He became ill soon after he arrived. She nursed him. She later helped change his entire wardrobe, advised him. She accompanied him to concerts and lectures. Uh, she introduced him to her friends. They entertained together. And their friends looked the other way and assumed they were an item. Now, Deborah. Better back at home is still working hard. She's still taking care of many of friend of Ben's uh, financial uh, situation. She's helping in the post office. Uh, ben, in fact, had instructed the new postmaster to listen to her because she and depend on her experience because she had so much there. So uh, and she's doing her usual other other things that she did. She's also trying to bring up Sally, who is now in her mid mid teens. Uh, and Ben is continually sending instructions about what, what they should have, how Deborah should be training her. So she's very busy um, and the letters go back and forth. Presents uh, go both ways too. Ben sends the many English goods and China and clothes and fabrics and all kinds of things. And Deborah sends all kinds of commodities and food and so on uh, from Pennsylvania to England. But we don't have her letters from this era, and it's frustrating, although we do know a lot of things about Deborah uh, from what other people have said, and we do know she had a, a bit of a prickly temper um, and that she could get very angry, um, but that she was also good hearted and her letters that we get later show that and a very warm giving person and totally obedient to Ben, at least uh, at this point, but what's the heartbreak. Here is that we don't have her letters for those years. Uh, he, it does return, but he does not return for five years. It was supposed to be six months. Uh, and he's only back in, in the state in, well, well, it wasn't even the States, the colonial America for a few years. And once again, the assembly sends him back. First of all, the pens have done nothing. The situation has deteriorated. And the American, the, the I say the preceding years to the American revolution, are alarming the colony and the colonies of America with the British, various British acts that are oppressive uh, and the arrival of soldiers who are actually lodging in Boston and uh, other places. So he's over there to try to reason with the pens and ultimately he, what he ends up doing as the revolution heats up is, is uh, dealing with many members of parliament uh, to try to calm the uh, hostilities down so there won't be a war. Um, so he's back again and he writes, uh, he's glad to be back. It's uh, very upsetting to him to be away from England because he loves it. And there are letters that he's written to Margaret that uh, some of which, you well, know, he doesn't show them to, to um, Deborah. It's, it's interesting. There's a lot more to say about them, but I don't want to take a lot of time on it now. You'll have to see it in the book. Um, but there's obviously a great deal of, of affection and depth. And also he, she has a daughter, Polly, I mentioned, and Polly, in contrast to Sally and his lectures to Sally, always about thrift and being good and going to church and being moral and, and all of this. He's, he's quite indulgent with Sally. He's about her age, um, about Sally's age, a year, I think a year younger. Uh, but Sally is curious, and he writes her long letters explaining natural phenomena and all kinds of other questions she asks about how chimneys are built and all kinds of things. And he's happy to be sort of her surrogate father. Uh, you'll see a picture of her next slide, please. Uh, there she is on her wedding. We think it's her wedding day. Um, and uh, he, she really becomes his surrogate daughter, and Mrs. Stevenson really becomes his um, surrogate wife. 
and he does talk about them as his English family. You can imagine how this makes Deborah feel. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just add this in rather quickly. Charles Wilson Peel was a young artist. He came American. He came to London to study art and he lived for a while in uh, Mrs. Um, Stevenson's home. And by mistake, he knew Ben, of course, and actually they live in the same house. He, he opened the door one day on uh, Ben's room and to his, his surprise, here is Ben with a lady. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see an even more explicit these he rushed back to his room completely embarrassed, but he, being the artist, he sketched what, what, what he saw. We don't know who that woman is, um, not been identified, and it contributes to the mystery of, of Ben as, uh, as, as, a, as a real womanizer. Next slide, please. Uh, ben is, um, stays in England for the next decade. Every few months, he tells Deborah he's going to come back, but one thing or another keeps him there, uh, including the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and he keeps working with Congress. And there's uh, there's all there's all kind of with Parliament, and there's all kinds of consternation and events that happen. And he finally becomes the uh, he finally. Uh, and Deborah keeps pleading with him, please come back. Um, she does have grandchildren. He compares her grandchildren to when Polly has, Polly's married and Polly has, he, 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 he has a competition about what he considers Polly's grandchildren with what he calls Deborah's grandchildren. He doesn't say our. And so there's a whole drama there, which really is part of this. Um, well, it's part of what makes, makes this story and their story so colorful and, and heartbreaking, I think, and poignant too. But anyway, by the time he wants to come back, um, it, Deborah has had a stroke and she dies in December of 1774. And it's really awful because for the last year of that time, she suddenly has stopped writing. And oh, I loved that I had 10 years of her letters anyway, because um, I could hear her voice and I learned so much about her. Um, but um, she, she's pleading with him to come back and he can't. So he doesn't get back till April of 75, just a, a few weeks after the uh, uh, bloodshed at Lexington and Concord. And so he's left a widow. Two years later, he continues, he immediately throws himself into the revolution. He's involved in many public services and the Congress uh, for, with the revolution. But two years later, he's sent um, again to France, this time basically by the fledgling United States. Of course, he's uh, been very involved in the Declaration of Independence and the starting of the new company, but he's sent to France to um, work with uh, one of three commissioners to try to obtain funds to defend the patriots against the British in the revolution. And while he's there, he meets this young musician. She's 33. She's married uh, to a wealthy man, uh, much older, and, uh, and she's the mother of of two daughters, but she uh, is also very famous as a musician, uh, and she she is uh, uh, specializes, I guess you'd say, in the new pianoforte. But she's so talented and was such a gifted musician that Boccherini devoted um, named his sixth piano sonata after her, and they have a passionate love affair. And she she throws herself at him, and he he concedes. Um, she'll sit on his lap in public. Uh, raising eyebrows. Um, she writes him over a hundred letters, uh, which are very they're erudite and they're humorous and they're witty, but they're also temperamental as she was. And he's completely taken by her and he returns the favor in his own wonderful letters. Um, again, and, and the, the correspondence there is, again is in place of dialogue and making this book try to come to life. And, uh, but in the end, she will not. Um, she will not be intimate with him, and he's stung. And he then begins. He's now in his seventies. He then soon meets. We go on to the next slide, please. Another woman, uh, and this is a widow uh, of a philosopher, a very well-to-do, uh, and he has passed away, of course. And she, uh, had, she's quite unconventional. I guess after he died, she decided she'd be her own person. I think of her as a sort of a an earlier, a prototypical hippie. Um, she dresses in a, um, these are earlier pictures. The first one on the left is the earlier picture of her. 
Um, but she uh, she's famous because she runs an, a sort of a, an elite salon with the leading philosophers of the revol of the uh, of the pre revolution in France, the Enlightenment. And he this is where he meets her, uh, and again a love affair. But he but uh, ensues uh, quite a quite a charming one. But she's um, she's uh, a bit scattered. She has uh, some single men who live in her house, and she sort of assigns them the job of keeping her schedule going and it doesn't always work. And a lot of times Ben appears as he, as he wrote once, he said he, he washed, he dressed, he quaffed, he, he got his horse and his carriage, he brought his grandson with him and waited because he was supposed to go to this wonderful dinner at her house and he, his, her estate and he got there and <laughs> she was off to Paris <laughs> visiting somebody else. So this goes on for a while and he becomes more and more insistent um, he and um, she continues. She leads him on. There's no question about it. She she's definitely a flirt, and she pro, she claims she loves him. But when he proposes marriage, she laughs at him, and that goes on for a long time. But he's serious. He wants to get married to her, and uh, he he wants to to uh, make that permanent. And um, at some point, it becomes almost violent where he's, he's, he's pleading with her for marriage. And she is so frightened that she takes off for the summer to tours. And later, as in many of these relationships that we have documentation for, they become good friends uh, in the end. So I'll just go on to my last slide, please. One more slide. Yeah. So this man who is known for his reason and rationality and discretion and, and uh, pragmat pragmatism. One of his favorite uh, maxims in, from old Richard's uh, almanac is, if passion drives, let reason hold the reins. But I, I know the pop, that's the popular and iconic vision. The male historians all over have written mostly about his accomplishments, all of which should indeed be written about. He was remarkable. He was a, really a genius, an inventor, a statesman, a, a scientist, um, a humorist, uh, a writer, um, and so on. Um, but they have not looked at this other side, this very human side of this man, where passion and prudence, I think, ward in this man. And I have to wonder that this cool demeanor, po political, always rational uh, human being is really almost a compensation for the private struggle that, that the women have revealed that he had between prudence and passion. So I think that's the end of the slideshow. Um, and uh, I just want to say that here again are the, the fictional techniques that I, uh, you might want to go back to that one. Uh, All right, hold on back to one that minute. One. I don't know if it's too late. Um, go back to that, but yeah. um, uh, can you get back to that one slide? Yeah, I'm trying. Hang on. Okay. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I have my own problems. Oh, it's with not. It's not problems. you. There we are. Okay, finally found us. Hang on one second. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm only seeing part of it. All right. I'm not seeing the whole thing. Okay. There you go. Okay. So um, I guess, you know, oh, no, go back to the yep. beginning. Yep. Um, I'm getting to that last page. All right. Okay. There we are. Good. Thank you. So, you know, I think um, as much as I could tell you, and I certainly didn't want to give you um, more than this, and I didn't want to um, belabor the point, but I think that you will see, um, or will when you read the book, and I hope you do, um, that I've tried to use these five elements um, that I think are really important um, in, in, in fashioning um, an entertaining and vibrant nonfiction story. So thank you. <laughs>